Emily O'Brien was going to prison. A love interest put Emily into a difficult position, and she was about to pay for it with four years of her freedom. But Emily saw this setback as an opportunity to get clean. While she was in prison, she saw something else. The chance to start a business that would not only help her start a new life on the outside, but one that would employ her fellow inmates, too. Welcome to The Business Heroes, a show where we talk to business owners about their journeys and what a journey we have for you right now. Emily O'Brien, owner of Comeback Snacks, has a story that's going to make you laugh and cry and inspire your faith in humanity. It has done that for me. I'm Craig Colby. I have a storytelling company called Colby Vision. And here on The Business Heroes, we are going to hear some great stuff from Emily. Emily, thank you so much for joining me today to tell me about your amazing story. Thank you for having me. Just before we get started into that, just what is your business? What do you do right now? Sure, my business is called Comeback Snacks and it's a gourmet popcorn company, but we do more than just pop popcorn. Uh, we actually hire former, the formerly incarcerated. So we help society as well, which is super important for my pur purpose in life. And it's just the right thing to do when you see how difficult it is ha for people who are coming out of prison to find legitimate employment. And where can people get your snacks? You can get them online at comebacksnacks.com. And also on our website, there's a list of over 30 retailers. And there's going to be about four more retailers that are going to be launching within the next two weeks. And so people anywhere in the world can order your popcorn online. Right now we ship all over North America. So Canada and the U.S. And... You know, Perfect. maybe by the end of 2022, it'll be global. Well, that's what we're looking forward to. But let's, I mean, you mentioned something very important. There was your employing the formerly incarcerated, which is your experience. Emily, how did you come to end up in prison? Well, I, I was one of those people that never thought I'd be in prison. And given my upbringing, you know, you, you're born in a great, great family. You have a great education. People are like, well, what the hell heck could have gone wrong? But the thing is, no one is actually immune to addiction, you know, no matter where you are in life. And in 2013, I was really struggling with um, alcohol dependency and, and some drug dependency. And so I and this was all to the result of like a family fracture that had happened. And I didn't know how to cope. It's plain and simple. I did not know how to cope. And I was re also running another business at the same time where, you know, you're under the illusion that in order to make deals and do all this stuff, like you have to always be out and busy and, and partying and everything like that. So the world's just kind of collided and I wanted to kind of quit it. And somehow I stumbled upon this, this guy that I met through work who was like, Oh, Emily, I really want to help you get sober. Like you don't need all this stuff. And I actually thought he had my best interests in mind. And that actually wasn't the case. And he ends up taking me on this trip and traveling with people that I know is not really unusual. Like I, I've traveled kind of all over South America and Asia, always with people. I'd never really had a problem. And so this wasn't anything new. I was like, okay, cool. This sounds fun. We get down there and three days in, um, he tells me that, you know, I have to bring drugs back with him. And where was, where was down there? St. Lucia. St. Lucia. So you're, yeah. you're on vacation with this guy in St. Lucia mm -hmm. and he says, come with me. We're going on a little trip. Yeah. And prior to our departure, he had actually even asked me if I'd wanted to do it. And I said, no, absolutely not. Like, I don't want to put my passport at risk. Like, I love traveling. And I, and then he was embarrassed. And he's like, I can't believe I even asked you that. And he's like, don't, don't worry about it. Like, there'll be none of that um, at all. And I, was, I actually believe that that might actually be the case. But it, it wasn't. And then when I got down there, he's like, no, you agreed to this. Like, you were just drunk and blah, blah, blah. So he's like, you're, you're doing this. Like, you wouldn't be on this trip if you didn't agree to it. And I was like, I am going to be so bad at this. Like, I'm, I'm a terrible liar. Like, I failed acting class. Um, this is not going to go over well. And he was just in such a desperate situation that, you know, he kind of took me down there with that and, and told these people that I was going to essentially be bringing drugs back with him. So I'll never know the true extent of how deep he was in it. Like there's my suspicions and then there's stuff that we got back from the court, um, based on their kind of how they dug deeper. But Considering most of what he told me was dishonest, it's hard to really say who he really was. And so lo and behold, right. I have, I'm strapped up with two kilograms of cocaine put on the airplane with him. And that's after we land at Pearson, you know, immediately pulled into secondary customs, like red flag nation. And, uh, you know, my body language was off. He also told me that like 
in order to help me stop panicking, he would take the drugs off me when I got to Pearson. Like I could take them off, put them in my backpack and he would take them through customs. And then again, it was like another bait and switch. When we landed, he was like, oh, it's too late now. So he never had any intention of doing that. Um, yeah, you know, red flag, so, Brady, yeah. it me and so got you're arrested. So you're at Pearson, mm -hmm. you're, they pull you in, right? Mm -hmm. They're gonna search you. Mm -hmm. What's going through your mind? Um, honestly, like I, I was nervous, but I also knew that I was eventually gonna have to tell the truth, but I wasn't gonna sabotage the operation before that happened because at the end of the day these were my drugs i wasn't about to play hardball you know everyone a lot of people that have heard the story have chimed in like oh you could have done this you could have done this and it's like <laughs> well no not when you have like almost two hundred thousand dollars worth of someone else's narcotics you're not just gonna be like help me like you really have to think rationally in in these situations and i was in a i was in a really deep mess like at that airport oh, yeah. but when when i got arrested i actually felt a sense of relief but I also didn't know what was to come. So again, that was my ignorance, so. Right, so I mean, everyone's seen too many movies about this, but if you do anything bad to the, these are not your next door neighbor looking over the fence who've, who've coerced you, or forced you to smuggle cocaine into another country. Mm -hmm. You know, you do not want to end up on the wrong side of these people, mm -hmm. right? They're not, they're not your friends. Mm -hmm. um, so you're you're relieved. You're not in a position you're uh, um, comfortable with. When they they finally um, confront you, like what do the what do the um, border guards say to you? What does customs say to you um, that busts it open? Well, they started with a series of like regular questions. You know, how long we've known each other, uh, what our relationship was. Again, I've been given no coaching as to like who I was that day. Mm -hmm. you know, I was like, am I your girlfriend? Like, how, I don't know. Like, who? Because he, he just, like, thought this would go over so flawlessly that this would even be a possibility that we'd be called into, into secondary. So I think he was just as, he was just as dumbfounded, right? And so um, I could kind of see the look on his face, and he just didn't know what to do, and I didn't know what to do. And so I told the truth. Um, but I also said, like, as the questions started getting more detailed, like, they were like, oh, okay, so – do you, do you party and all this stuff like that? And I was like, well, yeah, you know, I can't lie about that. And when was the last yeah. time? And I was like, oh, well, in Vegas a couple weeks ago. Cause I was true. You know, I've been to Vegas and bachelorette two weeks ago. And then they're like, okay, so Brian, like we just have to ask, you know, we, we feel like we need to do a, a, like a body search on you. So we just have to ask you before you do this, before we do this, are there drugs on you right now? And I stared at the floor and I was like, okay, I know that they can tell, you know, like uh, my eyes are darting all over the place uh, i'm like shifty i'm probably sweating and i'm wearing a cardigan which is like such a heat score sign of that like, you're doing something wrong because who wears a cardigan home from a caribbean destination and um yeah so they asked me if i had drugs on me and i said yes because i felt like that was you know lying to a federal agent at that point not gonna serve me well that's another log on the fire right yeah but how did you feel then Again, relieved. Again, relieved. I thought maybe I could just explain, you know, big misunderstanding. Um, throughout the trip, like he'd been like, oh, everything's gonna be fine. Like, you know, if, if anything happens, but it won't happen, nothing bad will happen. Like, don't, don't worry, like, I got you, like, whatever, it's fine. Like, I'll say it was, you know, it was, it was all me. And, and that never happened, like, at all. He totally didn't do anything, you know? So I was just then arrested and stuck in jail for a weekend and my parents had to come bail me out. Now, there's a lot we could talk about through there, but um, what is it like two and a half years later, later you were, and what's it, $50,000 worth of legal bills, you're going mm -hmm. to prison. Yes. And yes. What are you, what's going through your mind as you're, um, you know, in your mid 20s heading to prison? Um, in the beginning, I was mortified. I was furious. I saw it as a big inconvenience. And I was like, you know, I have this career, I have this, I have all these things to do. Like, I can't go to prison. Like, but then as time went on, I really began to see the actions that I kind of did. And I had to be honest with myself about my, my substance abuse. Because, yes, I didn't really, you know, plan this exotic trip to smuggle drugs so I could profit off the drug trade and drive a Lamborghini. Like, that just wasn't the case. But I also had ignored a lot of the red flags that I saw in him and chose to use substances to kind of ignore those things. Again, I took a shortcut. 
And so when I was going to prison, I kind of saw this as a way to, it was kind of like a new adventure. And I, I began to reframe it as, okay, I'm just going to camp. Like if this can easily happen to me, like I'm sure it's people that are just like me. Like I wasn't scared about who I was going to meet in there or if I was, you know, going to be exposed to violence or any of those things because I knew that I was just a human. And I also wasn't very confrontational. Like, like I stuck, I would stick up for myself, but I wasn't going to go like poking bears and, and trying to find problems. So I saw it as a, as a new journey, as a, like traveling to a new country. And what was, what was it like in prison? Um, so the first part I had to go to the detention center for 10 days and that was like maximum security, right? So before you get sentenced to like your actual destination, they have to like process you or whatever. And so that was like, you know, very dire, like living conditions. Um, the lights never go out. You're fed on a tray, very stereotypical jail stuff. And then after we got shipped to the federal, um, the federal penitentiary, like, you know, we were all shackled together. There's about 10 of us um, and shackled together in the back of a paddy wagon, right? You're like shuffling along, you know, the guards are like saying their, their stuff and, you know, just derogatory stuff. And I was just like, I don't even care if like guards insult me. Like I, I really didn't care. Like it didn't bother me. Like, I'm just like, okay, yeah, I know. I get it. <laughs> like, tell me something different. Um, but the first couple of months in federal prison were, were obviously challenging, but also I, prior to that, because I'd like planned it, like I knew where I was going. I'd done research. I'd, I had actually met a former inmate who'd been there who helped me get over some of like the uncertainties and helped my family as well, you know, because there's so many like little finicky rules that you don't ever think of, like when it comes to like, oh, having your possession sent in and what's allowed and what's not allowed and, and timelines and things like that. So just having that preparation really helped me have a little bit more ease about it. And I knew also that I was going to be away from like the alcohol and the drugs. And I was excited to be away from that. Like I knew I needed a hard stop. Like there was no like selective sobriety for me at that point, because when I was arrested, I kind of just got drunk a lot of the time. I was like, that that's how I tried to handle it. Didn't work. And so I knew that by actually going to prison, being away from these things, um, it was going to be good for me. I mean, listening to you is remarkable. The, the things that you talk about are not uh, the way I don't think anybody can anticipate them feeling going into prison, but for you to look at it as an opportunity to get clean and to go in and, uh, and work on yourself. Um, mm. I mean, we all, hope that's what prison could be, but it doesn't seem like it off from what we hear it often isn't what it is. And you said to me in our pre-interview that it was like going to a different country with its own set of rules and that operates differently than any place else. How yeah. quickly did it take you to, how quickly did you learn the language? Um, probably within like the first couple, like probably within the first month, you know, it had its own economy even, right? Like you could sell services, you could sell things. And it was actually really interesting to see how creative a lot of people in there were, right? Like people would braid hair for certain things or, you know, like do beauty treatments or eyebrow threading. Uh, some people would like trade food or whatever. Like I ended up doing someone's homework so I could get stamps, right? Cause I was writing letters. So I was like, okay, I'll help her with her homework and then she can get me stamps. <laughs> and uh, so somewhere along the way in there, you start thinking about a business. Mm -hmm. What happened there? Well, I've always been entrepreneurial. Like I've always loved to create and build things. And if I was gonna spend $50,000 on legal fees, that money was gonna go towards something, right? My sobriety, number one, but two, I knew that I had to use that time in there to create, to create something. And I didn't know what that was gonna be when I got in there, but I, after I kind of started listening to people's stories and seeing the struggles that people face and seeing, how many others struggled way more than I did. And, and I was like, Oh my gosh, I actually have a family that, you know, could bail me out of jail. I have people coming to visit me. I have a plan when I get out. And they're, the reason why there's so much um, like reoffending is because there is no structure for a lot of people and there's no support and they're punished for that. And that's when I knew that I wanted to create a business where I could actually hire people because again, a lot of companies won't, won't look at you. Right. They're like, Oh, like you did this. And, but I, I actually see people that go through adversity as having tremendous assets and having tremendous tenacity and, and resilience. And so that's why I was like, I wanted to bring that to the forefront and, and prove it through a popcorn company because popcorn is a very popular prison snack. <laughs> Let's talk a bit about more about that. 
How did you come to decide that popcorn was going to be the business you went into when you got out? Um, I decided it was going to be popcorn because uh, we, had, we were having a Super Bowl party and cooking was a very common form of like socializing in prison. Like in, in women's federal prison, if you're in minimum or medium, which I was, you cook all of your own food. And so you have access to like a grocery list and then you have a kitchen. And, and so people would, you know, make cupcakes or cakes or they'd have like, you know, themed dinners. And during this one Super Bowl viewing party, people were making, you know, their things. And one, uh, one of the popular snacks was, was popcorn. And I didn't mention this before, but like part of the reason that, that I had this alcohol and drug addiction was because I, I didn't, had an eating disorder in the past and I'd kind of turned to alcohol and drugs to kind of manage that. And I really didn't want the eating disorder to resurface when I was in prison. And so I wanted to create a healthy snack as well for myself. And I saw how many other girls in there also had, you know, eating disorders. And I was like, okay, like maybe we can create a healthy snack. And so that's when popcorn popcorn happened and like we put like this combination of like lemon pepper and dill on the popcorn and it was you know popped in oil and it was healthy and it was really good and then i began to think of like what other popcorn companies out there did more than just pop popcorn and i'm like sure popcorn is nothing new but why don't i take something that's not really new make the flavors different and the purpose different and then that's when you have something new and as you had told me in our pre-interview you were always good in school so well you know, smart was nothing new to you so you're I wasn't always good in school. <laughs> I like I, I was I was a strategic procrastinator. So like <laughs> I, I know the time. High, yeah, in high school I was I like, ah, oh, no, the my education needs to be in socializing here. And then like when the academics like were part was like, okay, if you don't graduate with good grades, like you're not going to get into university. That's when I was like, okay, now it's time to focus on the grades. Yeah. So um, <laughs> yeah, I was really good at that. And I also always worked, and I also always volunteered. So I was able to like collect experience in so many different ways. And I think this also helped me um, with my reintegration because I had now this massive network of people that I'd met because I always love to learn. I think like being curious is can be your best asset or your biggest liability at times. But, you know, I'd, I'd managed to acquire a big network who, who were ready to support uh, this new venture. Well, you never really know in your life what's going to lead to what. You know, mm -hmm. there's really something to be said for just pursuing your passions and doing things with no other goal other than to do them. And those things you did beforehand, you're saying, helped you uh, on the way out to get back yeah. inside. All those connections came back to you. So you decided, listen, popcorn's a good cheap snack. I've got a way, you know, we're going to put some new flavors into it. Uh, I have a purpose, which is to uh, help people come in out of the prison system. Mm -hmm. When did you start working on this? business in earnest inside prison it was built from the inside out you know i had some stamps i had my grit and i had my tenacity and i had my ability to, to listen and i think when we are able to listen to others and go go in with an open mind you can actually make something that is truly reflective of your lived experience and so not only did i just have my story but now i had i had listened to everyone else's stories i'd read like scholarly articles like the librarian of the prison would put me out scholarly academic articles on like the real problems of women in the drug trade and how it often punishes women more because women are in these relationships and then you know they get thrown under the bus or something like that and then they're thrown in prison for a really long time and it really doesn't do any good because now they're, they're separated from their families and um there's just like a lot of improvements that need to be made. I think obviously any wrongdoing like justice is a part of that, but I don't think the extent that the prison system punishes people over and over again. And again, as they reenter society is helpful at all. If in fact, it just creates more crime. It's like people, people in prison aren't the dangerous ones. It's like the prison system is, is what can make them vulnerable when they go out and make them, susceptible to reoffending because there's just such a lack of support and a lack of programming. Uh, and those, you know, we could do a whole discussion on that at another time because obviously sure. you have incredible insight to that. But when you're on the inside working on your business, mm -hmm. you know, you've come up with the idea, how are you, uh, what can you do to make that be ready for you on the outside? What did you do in that regard? Um, so one of my friends who knew that I was going into prison, who had kind of communicated it with on and off, uh, I told him about it. And I had also started writing blog articles about my experience. And then I would mail him at these articles and he'd take a picture of them and, and upload it to the internet. And so I was kind of building this brand, this story before I was even out. I'd also written letters to like 
well-known people in, in the business community and written to like radio stations. And so, like I wrote a letter to like Wayne Williams of, uh, what was it? 95.3 in Hamilton and being like, oh my God, I love this countdown on the weekend because it's like my ritual in prison. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I got out, he's like, come on the show. He's like, I never, you never know just who you're touching when you play songs on the radio, right? So um, that was really cool. And we also got little postcards made. Um, my business partner made them. And then as soon as I was out, I was able to like start getting these postcards and I would go to like little events and sponsor them. Like I'd, you know, spend 20, 30 bucks on kernels and popcorn and then I'd make these little bags. And um, actually the other thing that happened was that the warden, the former warden of the prison let me out for a day to help promote this product. So like, I can't, you can't run a business inside prison obviously, but she let me out and I had like a security guard and everything. <laughs> I have to go back to the prison at night, but it was like this uh, women's march, this women's empowerment march. And so they thought that was a great, a great thing for me to be at. So just, um, you told me a little bit about this in the pre-interview. So like you get out of prison to go to this and when you're out, you're cuffed, right? You're cuffed. When, you're, when you leave? When you're leaving the prison, right? Oh, you're not cuffed. You like, you're, you're my mom picked me up with McDonald's in hand. <laughs> oh, really? Sorry. I got that wrong. Um, yeah. So they let you out of the prison. Your mom picks you up. They bring you back at night. You're back in prison. How much time did you have left to serve when that happened? Um, oh, you mean for that event that I did? Yeah, for that event. Oh, for that event. Yeah, I had a security yeah. guard. I wasn't, I wasn't cuffed, Sorry. but I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had like, I think a month and a half left. So it was awesome. Oh. Yeah, I mean, that's a nice thing the warden did. I, You know the warden, I don't. But it's nice to see that they're encouraging that. So once yeah. you're out, once you're out, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. How, um, what state is the business in? When I got out, um, it's still very infancy stages. You know, we had a, a lot of work to do. And at, this, at the same time, like the parole system is, they don't want you being an entrepreneur when you come out of prison. It's just like not something that usually goes over well. So I took that time to find like a job at a gym, which is also, you know, very related to starting over and starting fresh. And so as I got a job at the gym, I started talking to them about my story. I went in and I was like, I just got out of prison and this is my prison resume. So I handed them this <laughs> prison resume of like all the jobs that I had in prison. And like, you know, I got my CPR in prison. I got my forklift thing in prison. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is what happened. I was like, I need to start somewhere. And they're like, this is awesome. So I literally got a call to, to work there like two days later or something like that. And, and it was awesome. And then it was because they don't judge anyone at that. It was called like Crunch Fitness. And it was it was great. And then I met so many people at the gym. Like I ended up talking to teachers there because it was near my, it was near my childhood home. And they're like, Oh my gosh, Emily, we heard your story. Like, do you want to come talk to my class? And they had like little events at the gym and I would give them the popcorn. So they're, they're a very supportive employer. Like they were awesome. Like I wish there was more like them. And, and sorry, since we should give them a plug, what gym was this again? It's called crunch fitness. People, people in your area should go get memberships at crunch fitness when we can <laughs> get out of here. Um, when did the business start to take off? I would say it started to take off, honestly, when I went full time into it. Like I ended up quitting the gym because it was just getting so busy with popcorn. And how um, long did that take? How long did it? How six long months. Were you gym? Six months. Six, six months. months you're going to make money at popcorn. Yeah. Because also you have to like invest in popcorn too, right? So you have mm -hmm. to like, but luckily when, when I shared the story with the press, um, we got a lot of community support and I knew that sure there's, it's always like downfalls about sharing your story publicly. You know, you got to deal with like the naysayers and like whatever, but I, I didn't care. Like I already made fun of myself enough. And I was like, there's no value in me not sharing the story. And that's when the bad side truly wins is like when they can silence you. And so I wasn't about to be silenced for no reason. Right. So um, that helped members of the community would like, you know, let us come to their events for free instead of paying for a booth. Uh, someone bought us our first popcorn popper. There was a print company that was like, here's $2,000 in free print. So um, it just goes to show like how much like, accountability and transparency and honesty can lead to opportunity. I just think it's so inspiring that you owned all of this. That yes. you, said, you know, so many people spend time trying to hide their mistakes and hide the worst of themselves. You know, our strengths are our weaknesses, right? You said your curiosity uh, got you into that, but your curiosity also got you out. Mm -hmm. So I just, I think there's a lot people can learn from, from what you've done. Um, yeah. So when you're, just to talk a little bit about the business, you're mixing your own, at this point, you're making money, you're making your own popcorn, you're mixing it yourself. Mm -hmm. 
what's what state is the what state is your business in now as far as you doing that part of the work well we've actually gotten so big that we've partnered with a co-packer. Um, so in order to get into bigger retailers and like help with our shelf life, we had to switch around some of the recipes. And so the, uh, the former state of the business, like we were doing everything like kind of like by hand and some stuff we still do by hand, but in order to have a long, like get into big stores, you have to have a shelf life of at least like nine months. And it's only like the bigger companies that have access to all this equipment that can really help do that. And so we've managed to get partnerships because, you know, I've researched online and one day I just waltzed in and I was like, Oh my God, I need help with this. And, um, it's all just, again, just waltzing in kind of, and, and telling my story is like not really something people have ever seen. You know, here's this girl from prison that wants to build a popcorn company <laughs> and has no qualms about it. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah, now we, um, yeah, we have co-packer in Mississauga and then we're going to have another one in Cambridge. So that can truly help with our output. It can truly help scale. It has very rigorous safety tests. Um, you know, they all get sent through metal detectors now and everything. Mm -hmm. so we send them our recipes and then they they pop it. And our staff has grown along with the business. So we have three employees now and they're just fantastic. And now instead of just popping in the kitchen, now they're out meeting customers, right? They're managing accounts. So- And are they telling their stories too? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, um, it's not the same thing, but we're all in a in a lockdown now. Our, all of our freedom has been compromised to some degree, and mm -hmm. you know, the more responsible of us are, you know, locking ourselves down more than others. Um, and you know, there's a, I've lost work. A lot of people have lost work. Um, a lot of people have lost a lot during this. Mm -hmm. But I really hope that people look at this story for what we're going through now and seeing what you've gone through, the way you've looked at the loss of your freedom, mm -hmm. uh, the compromise you've had as opportunities to do something else and draw inspiration from that. Mm -hmm. um, what have you learned from your journey? I've learned that claiming victimhood to anything is not going to help you create well. I just find it keeps you in the same spot. And sure, there was a tremendous harm done to me, but I do not use that as a crutch. Like if anything, I use it as a catalyst. Um, and just like now, like there's a lot of people that things have been taken away with, you know, the, that they have no control over. Right. And I was in that same situation too. When I felt like I had no control. Sure. I, I should have controlled my substance use hundred percent, but I did not go into this trying to be some drug Lord. Right. Like I just wanted to go home. And sometimes when we're in these like very emotionally, like challenging situations, you just make the, the one that keeps you safe. And so now like creating through chaos and coming out of chaos and building something within that is so fulfilling, right? And, and what I found was when I had more taken away, I had less to depend upon except for myself. And that is actually what makes you stronger. Uh, just remarkable and inspiring. <laughs> uh, Emily, where, where can people get your popcorn? Comebacksnacks.com slash shop. And then you can check us out on, on social. And we do tons of, you know, really quirky things. We do a lot of like education and awareness. Um, but first and foremost, promoting second chances and forgiveness. Um, you know, comebacks are not obviously easy to get. They're, they're not handouts. They are earned. So um, anyone is capable of making a comeback, but you just do have to have to try. So comebacksnacks.com. Well, and in the you're in the hamilton region so in stores around that hamilton region golden horseshoe people mm -hmm. can get it and get it in which stores we should drive people to those stores too oh my god there's like 30 on the website um but our most recent launch is going to be pusateri's all, all the stores in toronto um there's a bunch in kitchener waterloo there's like vincenzo's there's like 161 market um we're going to be in london soon as well at remark farms we are in like Innisfil at Good Friday Harbor. We're in Muskoka at Muskoka North Food Co-op. Um, we're in the Hallmark stores in the Hamilton area. So like, you know, Lime Ridge, Burlington Mall, um, Oakville Place. We're in the Cheese Boutique in Toronto. Um, we're in a store called Ozspot in Burlington, but they're all on the side. I, I could go on and on. Okay, well, um, I, yeah. <laughs> usually I don't do this gratuitous a plug, but I think it's warranted. Um, Thanks. People should Thank be- you. Sorry, <laughs> okay. people, people should be um, 
doing their best to get not to help you out. You don't need help. People should be doing their best to support your movement which is and really supporting important. everyone's movement. You know, I yep. think that's what it is, right? It's not just about supporting me. It's like about opening your mind and abandoning this idea that we're all perfect and just eroding the word judgment from our vocabulary and from our, our everyday life, because we never know what someone else is going through. And it's so easy to judge people based on like the decisions that they, that they see until they're in that same position. Right. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Listen, Emily, thank you so much for sharing your story and sharing your time. Uh, I will be talking to you later about other ways that we can work on to share that story because I think it's really, really important, especially now. And, you know, there's a lot of beautiful things about your story, but I think the most beautiful thing about it all is that you're not just doing it for yourself, you're doing it for other people. And in my mm -hmm. book, that makes you a business hero. Thank you so much. <laughs> The Business Heroes wants to hear your story. Contact me at craig at colbyvision.net. I guarantee your story will sound epic with this cool music underneath it. Colby Vision can help you find and share your story. Writing, video, we do it all. We can also show you how to do your own simple videos and teach you how to do interviews for a podcast. Thanks to Dave White for the editing, Tim Vesely for the music, and Kevin Francisco for the graphics. And thanks for watching The Business Heroes. We'll see you next time for another exciting adventure.